Hey everybody, my name is Daniel Krozik. I am the National Sales Director for Tightrope's uh, broadcast product for the cable cast system particularly. I work with the PEG stations uh, across the country. And uh, we are doing a webinar today as part of our PEG Experts Forum. And what we're doing with the PEG Experts Forum is trying to find ways to highlight not just the products that we sell, but the different things coming out of the PEG community. Um, the things that uh, we think would actually benefit our customers and other folks who are in the PEG community who aren't our customers. We decided that we wanted to, to help make things that were PEG-centric uh, more available to the community so that folks didn't have to have a 35-person company and travel to hundreds of trade shows like we are stuck doing in order to reach everybody. So this is the second one we've done. Uh, the first one we did was with the Open Media Foundation. And uh, there'll be others coming in the future, but we really wanted to, to do this next one with RuShare. And we wanted to do it with RuShare for the reason that they're the most peg-centric of all the companies that we've been working with on this type of solution. Uh, they come out of a background working in the peg market. Um, they've made a product that I think is really appropriate for, for all of our community broadcast customers who want to be able to track their resources and their members. And I'm going to let them get into the details of it. But before I do, I just want to say that you know, we've always been really proud of our own product. We've been proud of the interface for our product. But simultaneously, we wanted to make it so other systems like RuShare could control our product. So um, as I spoke about just a little earlier before the thing started, we have this page, labs.trms.com, and it has all of our open source projects on it. And then at the bottom, it has a link for our API information. And this is something, like I said, we're really, really proud of. Um, not just that we have an intuitive and effective way to schedule the system from within the web browser, but that if you were to deploy something like RuShare and you wanted the information from RuShare to be published into Cablecast or the information from Cablecast to be uh, pulled into RuShare, that we've already developed the way that those things happen. Um, we've had this API that you can see right here. We've had this for a long time. But we're actually just about to launch a brand new API that will actually be a a little more modern, um, and that's what RuShare is going to build around. Not this web service API that we've had for years, but the brand new one that we're just about to release. So we haven't done the actual uh, integration with RuShare yet. We've had a number of discussions about what would be useful to, to shared customers. Um, this is one of those shared customers, uh, Plymouth Mass, the PAC TV. And what we really want to do as we're um, you know, soliciting feedback from you guys throughout this uh, uh, webinar and, and, and afterwards is get feedback from folks on what they would like to see as a tie-in between their, their cable cast video system, their automation and their playout, and with the system that they use to track, you know, facility, whose check camera is out, who's an active member, uh, who's paid up for classes, whatnot. Because the ability for us to tie in with their product is, is very strong and we think there's, uh, there's good things to be done, but we, we didn't want to force it and say, ah, we'll make these work exactly like this and then find that's not actually what the, the members of the PEG community are looking for. So um, that's pretty much it for me. Uh, I'll take the questions at the end and, and maybe uh, provide a little comments, but mostly I'm going to be muted. Um, the folks who are going to do the presentation are, are Dan and Eric. Um, Dan Mio is who I'm going to transfer the screen over to and the presentation to right now. Uh, let me just change right this moment. Actually, you can just transfer it over to Eric. That'd be fine. Okay. Yeah. I'll, I'll actually transfer over to Eric. Um, before I do, I'll just say, though, that Dan has a really long background in PEG. I've known him for, I don't know, maybe 10, 11 years, and there are other folks here who have probably worked with him twice as long. Um, so, you know, uh, we're, we're, we've are we been around as a company doing this for about 18 years, and we recognize that folks who have a, a long background in PEG um, really understand the market and what they're needing, and, uh, you know, Dan's, Dan's that guy. That's why we decided we really wanted to work with them and give them this opportunity because Dan understands at a deep level what other folks doing this need and, and what they're looking for. So um, I'm going to transition now to Eric and I'll say goodbye. Well, I just want to say actually a couple words before we, we go to Eric. <laughs> I'm going to transfer the screen to him. So I want to uh, thank Daniel um, and Michelle and Tightrope for this opportunity. This is uh, this is great. We've been talking to them for probably about uh, a year about the integration between Rushier and, and uh, Tightrope. So uh, just to reiterate what um, uh, Daniel said is that we're still working on what we're going to do with that and how that's going to happen. Um, so yeah, like Daniel said, I come from a background in community access television. I worked in um, 
the uh, at work, I worked at BCAT, uh, Burlington, Massachusetts, and then Wilmington, and then I came down to Carver <clears throat> for, and I was there for about eight years. So I've worked in a, a couple different sized um, access centers, even the small, and uh, in all of them we've we've needed a, a system like that. Um, I used something in Carver. Um, for a while, um, but um, you know things have changed since then. So that's kind of why you want to move into something like Rushier, something that's um, cloud-based that you can access from anywhere, and um, that members can access, which is uh, one of the most important features of Rushier. Um, so just to give you a few highlights on how that works. Um, so the member, I'm just going to jump to the member side of it because I think a lot of people have interest in that and how that works. Um, and then when we start the demonstration, we'll get into we'll we'll start with the administration side. But um, so the member side, um, members can do a, a lot on their own site, and you can give them um, whatever permissions you want. Um, but what the main things that they can do are make reservations, um, which is a neat thing against their own productions. Um, they can pay for classes. Uh, they can pay for memberships, and they can also sign up for classes. And uh, one thing they can do too is um, they can uh, schedule um, with the other members, the crew members in a production. So let's say you wanted all your crew members to meet, meet at a certain place, certain time. You can do that through RootShare, and that will be emailed out to all the other crew members. Plus, it will land on their uh, RootShare homepage, and then they can answer yes, now I'm coming, and why they're coming or why they're not coming. So <laughs> those sorts of things we built in. Um, there's a lot of automatic uh, email reminders in, in RuShare, which will help save you uh, time and money at your access center. So uh, things like membership reminders, where maybe you've sent out letters before to all the members to remind them that their memberships are due. Uh, RuShare does it automatically. You don't have to push a button. You don't have to do anything. It will do it automatically, and then people can pay through their RuShare site. So there's it's all hands-off there. Um, certainly, they can still bring in a check to the, the access center. You can record it through uh, in Share that way too, but um, so those are a few things that uh, help you save some time there. Uh, late equipment remind reminders um, uh, and a few other things. Um, I think that's it for me. Um, just want to give you those highlights. I'm going to send it over to Eric, who is. Uh, the other owner uh, of Rusher and the developer, <laughs> uh, more importantly. Um, so I'll send it over to him, and he will start the demo. All right. Hello, everybody. Um, you can see my screen, right? So City Media. I can see it. Yes. All right. So I'm and assuming everyone else. Can. <laughs> All right. Uh, like Dan said, there's a, a couple ways of looking at Rushier through the administrator standpoint and through a member standpoint. I'll be taking you through both of them. Right now, I'm going to take you through the administrator side, since that's probably more important to you guys right now. Um, as you can see here, this is your your introductory screen. Um, it's customized for whether you're an administrator or a member. But right here, you'll see it's all customizable. You have the um, the logo, all the text down here is all customizable. And then on the right there, you'll see um, things you had to take care of today. So before we get to that, I'll, I'll go into the administrator setup. We tend to do that really quickly just so people can see how these things are managed. Here's the things you saw earlier on the, on the page before, messages of the day, several of them. Here you have various information about, about your center. So those messages, the, those, um, those, those end up on everyone's pages, including the members. So you can change those as frequently as you want to. If you have you know, major things coming up, they'll log in and they see those immediately on their home page. Yeah. Um, down here, yeah, this is all information that doesn't change very often. So you'll, you'll see a few of these around here. So you just collapse down and kind of hide that information away. So here is where you start to administrator, administer the site. Um, these are our feature role access. This tells who can see what. So you'll see this is the administrator. The administrator can do all these tabs up here. Generally, you won't need classes, so we'll turn that off, and then, go, then you have to re-log in for that. Um, for members, on the other hand, you'll see almost nothing, so you'll see just classes and potentially just uh, productions, and then you have a few other, a few other um, account types that you can manage. Can I just jump in with with a member? So, if if you have the, if you're setting permission for a member and you select productions, they can only see the productions that they are involved in. Um, so that they're, they're crew on. 
Uh, furthermore, you can set more um, permissions in the production itself. You can set that to, and I'm just jumping ahead here a little bit, you can set that to view so they can just see the information, view modify, which means they can make reservations off of it or set it to none where they, where they won't be able to see the production at all. So there's, there's a couple different layers there in terms of production. Yeah, yeah, I'll show that more when I get to the production stuff. Okay. All right, in here we have uh, various user types. Um, and how uh, the cost to renew and how long the membership duration is. You can set these up yourself, have an e-number. Uh, this is useful later for um, membership renewal. Uh, production types is just a standard list, and a, a list of production types, which we'll see in the production page. So list of vendors, pretty self-explanatory. All the people that you work with, this is one place to put it. Uh, this is a fairly big tab. This is your email tab. Uh, this contains a combination of the automated emails and uh, I guess, um, you know, driven email types. So like, um, here, let me see here, like a late equipment reminder uh, and membership remo renewal reminder, those all go out in the middle of the night uh, when, uh, when a user, say for instance, their membership is about to expire, it'll send out an email automatically. Uh, you can customize these by just clicking on it here. All of them have to be turned on. They're not uh, naturally on, so you don't have to worry about all of a sudden your members getting lots of uh, lots of emails that you you, you don't want to send out. So, like I said, you can customize the text in here. Uh, these are the parameters that you can put in. There's a bun bunch of different ones. We have reservation requests. So if uh, a user makes a reservation request, it can send out an email to anybody in the center. So this one has a bunch of uh, has a subscriber list, so you can have whoever your administrators within your within your access center getting those. Uh, here we have just some generic settings. This helps for automatic uh, member ID creation and inventory ID creation. That was a request from one of our sites. And we have a Google Calendar uh, feed. You can feed your own Google Calendar into uh, the calendars within Rushare. I'll sh show you that later. This is the logo you saw earlier. Again, so you can customize your site. Uh, this is the payment tab. This is how you hook up payment um, to your to your site. Um, this is not your main PayPal. This is through PayPal. This is not your main PayPal account. This is an API account, so you don't ever want to put your PayPal account here. And one of the best features, and this is mostly here for demo purposes, is to the ability to import data, both your equipment, um, facilities, and package lists, and your user user lists. Um, this is something that you we will give you a template for. You can fill out the data and give it back to us, and we'll do it because it's it's a little on the tricky side. All right, from there we'll go to what stuff you do on a day-to-day -day basis. Uh, this is the uh, checkout page. This basically shows you what is going on in your center for the for any particular time span. This happens to be for the month, but you can cut it down today or a week. And these little pop-ups here will give you an indication of what the particular checkout is for and uh, what production it's on and who it's reserved to. So it just gives you a quick look. And you can always click on these little links and it'll pop up see these all over the place, but it just pops up the information you need. Down the bottom here, you will see the uh, reservation the re reservation approval, approval process. So here you have a bunch of members have uh, requested to use this in these, uh, reserve these pieces of equipment or facilities. You go through here, you click on any var varying number of them and approve them. And you get warnings if that's, if that's applicable. Try doing some other ones here. Well, all right, we'll skip on to here. All right, then after they go there, they go to the awaiting uh, pickup. So this is where where you would look when uh, a user comes in to a member comes in to actually pick up the pieces of equipment. Uh, from here, you again, you just approve it. Uh, yeah, it. yeah, yeah. Yeah, it's got to be the same user. It seems to be hung up here. Oh, there it is. Whoop. All right, there we go. Not sure what the delay was here. Usually that's pretty snappy. Um, here is a uh, 
an alert page or the user card as I like to call it. It tells you all the information about that particular user. Their, their member photo will come up. Um, any kind of indication of any alerts that this user has, anything you may need to know whether you want to decide whether you to, to actually check out this, um, this equipment to the user or to the member. You also get uh, the ability to generate a reservation receipt, so when you hit OK, uh, You have to allow pop-ups for, for, for this yeah. site. Yeah, for example, allow pop-ups. Whoops, no, I was on the wrong page. All right, so I have a big L here. to be having some performance problems today. This usually doesn't happen. All right, well then you move on to the checkout and this is where a list of anything that's within the last, in the, within 24 hours of checkout would appear here. And then anything that's past that will be an overdue that's kept so separately so that you can see any overdue information or any overdue um, pieces of equipment will pop up here. And in, and that last, over, in, in that over, can you just go back to the overdue tab one more time? Um, if you go back to there, um, you'll see in uh, check-in lost, check-in damaged. So you can check pieces of equipment in that have been lost or damaged, and that will appear in the notes and alerts section for that user. Um, so next time they check stuff out, you can see if they've checked stuff in lost or damaged in the past, and then you know you can either deny the, the equipment request or, or accept it. So it just gives you another information base there. Also, all along the... Uh the process here, you'll see these pluses. Um, that gives you extra information. So overdue here, you'll get to see who was requested by, approved by, and released by. So you get a complete list, a complete audit of uh, of who did what and when. So you'll never have any kind of uh, lack of transparency about about your checkouts. And again, here, this uh, the return return tab has a list of all of the most recently returned items, so that you can uh, you can see what was returned when, in case you some lost track of something or whatever. And it, it goes back pretty much forever. And also, everything's searchable, so we have those search boxes everywhere uh, in Rushare and sortable as well. Okay, we'll go on to the user page. Um, this is pretty standard. Um, you can create a new a new user up here, or you can edit through here. Um, you can auto auto renew something, or renew a member up here. These your member types that you set up in the in the administrative page I showed earlier. This is the member ID. This is can be auto generated again, like I showed in the administrative page. Again, another one of these drop downs. It just shows. It shows um, their information that's not going to change very often. It also shows what the uh, what role the the member belongs to. So usually, generally, most members would be down here in the member member checkout. Let's see. Let me pick somebody who. Yeah, pick Elmer. Here you'll have the member photo. Uh, you can change that yourself at any time. Of course, this is the notes and alerts that you saw earlier in the checkout process. It tells you anything you need to know about the about the member when they're checking things out. Here's a list of all the things they're certified for. You can add certifications in here. Just, just click and go. Uh, this is a list of the productions they're actively involved in and once they actually have the permissions to, to see, that, as Dan kind of mentioned earlier. Uh, you can be part of a production but not have the ability to see anything. So you would not have, you not, would not see those in here. And a list of the reservations they've made. It's a good place to see if they took something out and broke it or checking for someone who has some experience with a piece of equipment. Uh, okay, and then also up here you have organizations. Our members can belong to list, belong to an organization. You can add members. You'll see these dialogues all the time. They're, they're meant to be pretty robust. They're searchable and sortable and... Uh, and uh, you know, and, and meant to be as useful as possible. 
right, here we go into the assets. This is again a list of all the assets that are within your system. Again, you can create a new one up here, as always, and then you can edit here. This is all the maintenance records for a piece of equipment and all the people who have taken out this piece of equipment. So again, if you're looking for someone who has some experience with a particular piece of equipment, you can do it here. There's multiple ways to see where um, the reservations for a particular piece of equipment or um, a person. So you can see the reservations for you know, all the equipment there, and then if you go back, again, go back to users, you can see it, see what they reserve. So everything um, can be accessed in multiple ways. Yeah. Um, as far as setting up the piece of equipment, uh, you have categories. Those can be added right here on the fly. Some of the, most of the settings that we did, you can um, do through the administrative setup. But things like the category and location, we decided to have set up in this area because they do change more often. Um, so yeah, and we didn't we didn't want to take you out of the middle of editing a piece of equipment to go all the way back to another page and lose what you're working on. So that was another reason for doing this. So same thing here with location. Um, you can add. At a location at any time. Um, here's where you can add this this piece of equipment to a facility or a package. Facilities have the ability to are, are a form of packages in themselves, and packages are obviously packages. You may also know them as kits, but you can put if you want to create like a studio, and everything within that studio becomes part of that studio. This is where you would do it. You would just add all this, all these pieces of equipment to the to the facility. I mean, you'd add this piece of equipment to the facility in this particular case. You can also do it to the facilities page. So if you go to facilities and you add a facility, then you can add the assets to that facility that way. So again, a couple different ways to do things. Yeah. A list of manufacturers, pretty straightforward. You can, again, add and edit it right here. There's the vendors. That's the list of vendors you saw, again, in the administrative page. Uh, this is where you can certify someone. This is a list of all of the courses. A course and a certification are basically the same thing, but I'll get to that more later. Again, you can just check off what, what you need to be certified in to use this particular piece of equipment. All right. So then that um, certification um, information will show up during reservation. So if uh, an employee is making a reservation and it, come, it will come up if they want a camera and they're not certified within that camera, um, that will show up in the reservation dialog box, which we'll get to in a, in a little bit. All right, here's the uh, facility page. This is where, again, where you edit a facility. Same kind of thing, categories. Categories are specific to the type of asset, so there'll be ones for each for equipment, facilities, and packages. Um, location, again, same thing. Again, this is specific. All right, here's where you can add in your assets for this particular facility. Again, just click anything you want. Add things in. There you go. Pretty straightforward. Packages are essentially the same thing. <clears throat> Packages are reservable, though, so you can obviously reserve a whatever you know camera package or portable studio package, whatever the package you want you want to call it. Um, these are things that are reservable. Whereas facility are reservable, but all the stuff kind of goes with it. It's sort of like a package, I guess, but it's a little, little bit different. Yeah. yeah. Again, categories and locations. Uh, and if you, you can add this particular, you can add packages to facilities. So again, you can bring up a list of your facilities, just include it in this box to Studio A. Again, a list of reservations for anybody who's taken out this particular package. Okay, we'll go into courses. This is a list of all your courses. This is pretty straightforward stuff. Um, this is the prerequisites you need to take a course. When it comes to prerequisites and certifications, we only inform but don't, do not enforce. That's up to you guys to decide whether you want to enforce your prerequisites or not. Again, you can just list the courses as always. You just click and add that in. So just to clarify, a course is not where you would add students, you wouldn't make reservations, and you wouldn't add sessions. A course is like camcorder course or studio or advanced studio, whereas a class is 
um, that's where you would you're taking Advanced Studio, but it, you specify um, sessions and 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 uh, students that right there. Yeah, class is an instance of a course, so we'll go to class setup. See, here's where the course comes in. This is the course that you'll, that you'll be teaching. Have a couple of instructors. Enrollment start date and end date, those are very important for it showing up on the uh, classes tab, which is down the end here. I'll show you that in a minute. Yeah, I'll get make you a little schedule description so it's a little clearer. Uh, number of, of uh, students, that is maximum. Uh, description and any potential cost. Users, um, I mean, members can be waitlisted, um, so the capacity there is not necessarily a hard limit. Um, you can ask student, again, this is the same kind of uh, user or member dialogue you'll see over and over again. You can just, you know, just click them and add them in. Um, this is where you set up the sessions, the individual sessions, so if you want to get rid of these. Yeah, I better know. Yeah, there's outstanding. So you can schedule it for today. Boom, and then you can you can duplicate that the number of times, number of sessions, three. I couldn't duplicate, uh, delete those other ones because there's reservations against it. So it's just duplicated three times, and boom, you have all your class sessions. Before that, though, you should actually make your reservations because reservations will also be copied. Um, so this is where you. This, I'll, I'll show you quickly the reservation page right here. We'll do this better in the in the in the production thing. But this is where you make all your reservations for your class and your individual sessions right here. So you have six sessions. So if you if you need different different things for different classes, you do it right here. All right, and go on to productions. This is your list of productions. This is a, productions are unlike um, unlike most things. You administrator sees all productions. But for members, they only see their own, which is a little bit different than the way that some of the other ones work. So this is a production page. This shows the reservations that are outstanding for this particular uh, this particular production, which are pretty extensive. If you want to add more, you go down to the Add Reservation page here, uh, and you just uh, you know you can put in time and date, any time and date that you want. Let's uh, let's go tomorrow. And then you search, and you get a list of everything that's available for tomorrow. You can click and click these and add them. Facilities, you can also do it here. You can also select categories of things to filter if you want yes. to. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. If you only want cameras. So that's where you cat when you set up categories in your in your asset list. That's where categories are important. So a category would be a camera, a lavalier microphone, a tripod, a handheld microphone. That would be an example of a category. I think the webinar is affecting this, uh, affecting the site a little bit. All right. All right. So anyway, you, like I said, just click on this and click on this, and then you just request from all. You have to sign it to a crew member, sign it to Albert Einstein, and then down here you get confirmation that the reservations have been made, and they pop up right here. So you see October 29th, October 29th. And then they go for approval to the checkout page. Yep. So essentially, the, the way reservations are made are they're all through productions. Um, so you need a production, and then you need a crew member on that production to reserve to. And that, that will, why we do that is because it enables for better tracking of all your assets. Um, if you didn't have a production, you wouldn't be able to just track things as well. They'd just kind of be reserved to whoever, whenever. Um, but through this, now you have a list of what productions are using what. So if someone has, uh, has made a production and they've reserved stuff for the last six months, they have like 45 reservations, and you haven't seen um, a show come out of that, you can say, um, <laughs> there's a lot of reservations against this, where's the show? So that's why we did that. Okay. Here's where you add in crew. It's a particularly large crew. Again, it's the same standard uh, dialogue you've seen over and over again. You can search and sort, of course, and add anybody you want. Uh, you, can, you can schedule a crew. 
So you can schedule them right here. Here's that cruise schedule I was talking uh, to everyone about at the very, very beginning where you can um, schedule. This uh, isn't for reservations. This is, yeah, what Eric's yeah. doing. So you can schedule people to be at a certain place or reminder about whatever, a pizza party or, you know, let's go out tonight, whatever. Um, it's And then that ends up on each member's home homepage, that, each crew member's homepage, and they can respond from there. It will also be emailed out to them. Yes. So. Over here on the right, you'll also see the permissions that Dan spoke about earlier. Um, these two have no permissions. These two have view permissions, and these can do full, modify, and view. So be careful on how you assign that one. You can change that any time by coming in here and just changing it right here. So you're not locked in stone with that. Uh, you can also view the entire schedule so you get to see. And you can yeah. also delete all those too. So there's a delete button over there on the left. Yep. Now this will be hooked up to email soon actually. We've been adding emails as they've been requested and this one will have a, an email where it gets sent out to all these members so they know where to go and when. Okay, over here we have a base assets. This base assets indicates the equipment that you think you will need for doing the shoot over and over again, if you do the shoot over and over again. So you so you specify this, you have your list again, another one of these dialogues. You can just pick the equipment or facilities you want, pops up here. And then back here in the reservations, you'll see base configuration. And this is what what you specified in before, so you just search for it, and it'll tell you what you can and can't get. These these two pieces of uh, equipment are already been taken out, so it'll tell you that, so you can make adjustments as necessary. But these other two are available. It's just that's, a quicker way of, of getting to what you're going to need every time. That's that unavailable um, flag. That's the only place that it will show up in reservations because if you're just reserving other equipment, um, if the equipment isn't available, it won't show up here you're asking for very, very specific pieces of equipment for your production, and that's why we, we put that unavailable for that for those base assets. It's for like a, a member, uh, I've run into this, where this member wants camera number one. You know, for some reason, they like this camera. It supposedly works the best, and they really want it, so you can assign that as a, as a base asset. And if it's unavailable, it will tell you. Yeah. And if we hadn't put the unavailable there, you might have missed out on a piece of equipment you needed. So just an extra layer of information. And episodes are just, you know, sub-productions under this particular production. It's, it's the same thing as a production. It's just, it's just underneath a particular production. So. Do you want to, um, uh, since it's already 2.30, do you want to run over to the, um, the membership side real quick, and then we can start answering some questions? Or Yeah, yeah, I'll do that right now. All right. So this is the member side of Rusher. Okay, so this is um, Albert Einstein's account. It shows basically everything that he has to uh, he has to worry about. Again, um, over here you'll see the equipment that are awaiting pickup and stuff that's been checked out. It's basically what the member has to. Uh, has going on at any particular moment. Also, the the classes that they've scheduled to to take in any production events. So, and their profile. Actually, the profile can be pretty useful. Um, this is where a member photo is. Um, they can't change their own member photo. We we have been, had a request to take that out because, well, for various reasons. Um, indicates what they're certified in, so they know any reservations that they have out or have taken out. Analyst of all the productions that they are a part of and their normal user information. And here is a calendar of what's going on for this particular member so they can see everything that's been checked out and when it's due and any classes. Um, here's their reservations. These are production events. This is what I just put in earlier, Cooking with Bob at Town Common so they know, know their particular schedule. I mean, click on one of those. So just going back to production real quick. You can click on one of those and hit the confirm button to confirm they're going. Oh, or yes. Not. Yep. Um, yep. Yes, no, and the reason. Yes, no. And that will show up on everyone else. Yep, that shows up in the schedule. 
This was designed to allow members to really engage the center of the site, if desired. It doesn't have to be that way, but uh, this is one of the ways we did that. And a list of the classes that they're going to be attending. All right, there we go. Yeah, I think the webinar is affecting the network performance of this. I think it's a little overloaded. So there we go. The list of all their classes that they're going to be taking. So back home. If, if they want to sign up for classes, you want to just go over that. Yeah. All right, and here's the classes page uh, that allows you to search and sign up for classes. It also shows the cost right here. So if a member wants to sign up for something, sign up for here. Uh, the sign up and pay will only appear if you have signed up, uh, set up PayPal. Otherwise, it's just sign up. And then you can just sign up for the class, and it, it'll tell you to bring a, a check to the class, uh, the first class. Pretty straightforward. And of course, that all appears down here, telling what class they have to, what they're signed up for. Oh, that should be there. Great. All right. Uh, I think that covers most of it. I am going to show you guys something that's in development right now, something that's been asked for a million times. So. All right, here we have reports, probably the most asked about feature. This is uh, this is still in development, but it's pretty far along. This will this is the stats page, and it shows you nine different charts over two different uh, time ranges. The top ones up here are the last 30 days, so you get to see all the logins that have happened over the last 30 days, how many new members you've created, um, member renewals that you've had. Uh, equipment reservations, facility reservations, daily rental value of the stuff that's been checked out from those reservations. By the by, the way, equipment reservations and facility reservations only appear after they've been checked out. So requests don't appear here; only actual checkouts. Um, this is your class number of people that have signed up for classes, number of, of completed productions this week, and then this is just sales. So anything that like member renewals or class payments will also appear here. There's, there's no data there right now. Up here, it's just in tabular form. Let you see it a little bit easier. It's not quite as pretty though, and this will allow you to see historical stuff. So, in two years, you'll see bars right next to each other, so you'll be able to compare year to year and uh, see if you're growing or not. From there, there will be a couple more tabs. Um, there'll be a user and asset tabs that will have the ability to query specific things uh, for users and assets, like um, you know how many how many people signed up by by uh, type. By a member type, assets like um, you know reservations that have that have occurred over a date range, and things like that. Um, still taking suggestions for reports. So if if people have any, they're more than welcome to give us suggestions. As as always is the case with all of uh, Rushier, we've taken we've taken more uh, more suggestions than I can count. To be honest with you, so <laughs> they're always welcome. And, but that, that's why we we that's why it's it is what it is is because of. Um, Access centers, I and mean, we didn't just, you know, we thought of the the idea, of course, but um, you know, access centers have really added to this and said, you know, we need this, we don't need that, and that's that's why it is what it is. Um, that's why it continues to be and, and it continues to grow, like it is. So. Yep. I think that pretty much wraps it up. Going forward, um, we're looking at as as Daniel suggested, integration with Tightrope. Uh, there'll be a little bit of barcoding will be added in, um, some more emails as as they're requested, like the scheduling email I mentioned earlier, um, you know, and a, and a few other more minor things. Uh, we're going to make it a little easier to make reservations, and uh, I think that's the major things we're working on in the upcoming time. Frame. Great. Um, there might be some more for you to say, but let me just start with one of the questions. Actually, the only real question that came in. Uh, we have a question saying, if a member takes a class, are they automatically certified to check out that camera, assuming that you know it's a class or a camera, 
uh, or does an admin have to click a cert checkbox that they are certified? So could you speak to, you know, A, how you handle, you know, when someone completes a class and how that then ties into certifications? Sure. Let me, uh, let me bring that up. So when a class has been uh, <coughs> completed, just click their name, and then you could set, you could change the uh, status of the of the class. And if you set it to pass it to certified down the bottom there, it will certify them and add, automatically add that to the user. So there's nothing specific you have to do past just letting the system know that they have been have passed the class and they're now they will now be certified. Great. Um, Does that answer the whole question? question? Yeah, I think that answers. Um, Jen, if, if that's not a thorough enough answer, please uh, please ask another through the, the webinar. Uh, Steve from Nashua has a question. He says, I'm sorry if this is answered already, but can we print any reports such as equipment in a particular package? So I think he's asking, you know, about uh, the detail level of reports um, Related, you know, reports related to particular pieces of equipment or reports related to particular packages. Um, there are asset-based uh, uh, reports coming in. You will be able to print them. Um, we're hoping to be able to um, save them to a PDF or uh, an Excel spreadsheet or, or um, yeah, I guess that that would be the only two. Yeah, and then print it also. Okay. Um, there's some other questions too. Go ahead, please. Go ahead. Just to follow up, so we just we started with that master report because that gives a really good snapshot of what's going on at any anyone's center at any particular time. Um, so that's kind of why we started with that. I mean, you guys, you got a you know nice um, bit of information right there, and then we're going to go into the more detailed reports for each um, for for each section. So, okay. um, there's a couple more questions. Um, three more. Uh, two of them I think really re relate to reports, so I'll go with those first. So. Uh, Ed asks, can I export the report data to another file? So I'm assuming, and Ed, correct me if I'm wrong here, but I'm assuming Ed means can he get the report data out as a XLS or, you know, CSD or, or some sort of format he can pull into another document for editing or... Yes. Yes, you can. Um, actually, I can show you a version of that, hopefully, you know, if the network is strong enough. You can actually export your data right now. Um, that will happen right through here. You see these up here, the copy, CSD, Excel, PDF, and print. If it, you had to hit low data, this is a fairly um, bulky query, so I don't generally hit it right now. But once it's in here, you just hit these buttons, and you can uh, export it to a CSV or Excel or a PDF. So, yes, you can get at your data. And uh, speaking of which, you can export. You're not locked into to RuShare. Just to let you know, you can export your users here, and you can export your your assets here and your reservations here. So that, okay. that functionality already exists. Um, another question uh, kind of related to reporting. Um, William asks, you mentioned that if someone requests equipment and it isn't available, then it doesn't show up in the reservation. Can you track what equipment has been requested and denied? Uh, in the reservation page, uh, reservation dialog, you can actually see a calendar that will indicate what's been taken out. It's, it's very much like the calendar you saw earlier, but this is also for members so they can see everything that's going on. This is another request by an access center, so your members can kind of see what's going on before they reserve equipment, and they can just kind of see a, a breakdown. Okay. Now, I may be misunderstanding William's question, but I kind of take away from it that he's thinking, well, if, if we've had 10 demands for the camera on a particular date, we only had two, you know, cameras that were able to be checked out. Is there a way to see that folks were making an attempt uh, to re reserve the other items? You know, get a get record of all the things people were trying to get, so perhaps you had an uh, argument to get more resources or at least could see when you have not quite enough equipment to meet people's needs. Uh, not at the moment. There's no okay. ability to do that. So you're, so, so you're kind of interpreting as if someone attempted a reservation but didn't actually follow through on the reservation? Is that recorded? Well, the way he said it is, can you track what equipment has been requested and denied? And I don't know if it's, it's correct to say that when you know, someone actually gets denied the equipment or perhaps just that equipment doesn't show up for something for them to select. 
Well, but, well if, they, if they've requested the equipment, it means that they've found equipment that is available for the time they want it. So that, right. re that request goes into the administrative area, and then that's where it's approved. And then the, then the administrator, employee, whoever, um, would, e would either um, approve it or deny it there. And that, that is recorded. Okay. So just to be clear in my understanding, um, if the equipment's not available, folks can't even request it for that day because they can only right. request stuff that's not checked out. It, but you it will can. Not. Right. right. Yes, that's true. Yes. Yeah, and then there's no ability to say we wanted to request this but wasn't available. Unfortunately, not, not at this moment. Great. Great. Um, just a, I have a couple more questions to get into, but I just want to say both uh, – Ed wrote back and said that uh, that's exactly what he was asking about was being able to export to Excel. Um, that's a big positive for him. And I think William also wrote back saying that um, that was exactly what he was asking. So I'm glad we've gone through those. Um, two more questions that have come in. Um, I'll, I'll go to the one from Brian from uh, Fresno. Uh, says, I came in late. Sorry if this was talked about. How can RuShare be integrated into our existing website? Are there advanced options to change the appearance of RuShare? Well, the only way really to set it, to do that right now is just to provide a link off your main page and uh, send it over to RuShare. As far as like changing the color scheme or anything like that, that would require uh, changing the CSS. And right now, that that ability doesn't exist. Got it. But you can take the link. I mean, you know, RuShare is essentially a web site. Um, mm -hmm. You know, so you, you log into it. So you can just take that link. And you know, have it on your website as you know, logging here, you know, to make reservations. Whatever you want to call that link, you can have that as a link. Great. Um, we've got more questions coming in. Um, to the to the next ones in order. Actually, I'll skip Chris Miller's because he's asked two. I'll uh, I'll come back to Chris's both of his questions. There's a question from Nick. He says, "I'm not sure if this question was addressed, but I currently use Facil." which I would imagine most folks uh, in this webinar either currently using or used at one point. It's been the dominant facility checkout uh, tool for so long that uh, uh, it definitely feels like it. Um, but it says, I currently use Facile. Can I export my member information and equipment database out of Facile and into RuShare? Yes. Um, yep, short and sweet. That, that's what this was earlier. I showed it on an administrative page. Again, you should never attempt this yourselves because I can guarantee you it won't work. But that's what this is for. You so it's part of your process of setting somebody up is you'll actually work with them to get the export out of Facile of all the info and help pull it all in so that when they start testing with your product or, or using your product for real, they have all their Facile information right away. Yes. Yeah, we'll send them the template. They'll fill it in and then just give it back to us and and we'll you know fix the errors because there's always going to be tons of errors. I've never had it successfully go in the first time, so it okay. usually takes about a dozen times. That's Good why we'll – but you but you've already addressed that um, that data dump in a way that even though you have to do it manually means that folks wouldn't have to start from scratch. No, no. yeah, we we've imported half a dozen or more sites already. Perfect. Okay, so um, I'm sure more questions will keep trickling in, but I got two here from Chris. I'll go with the simple one first. <laughs> uh, well, I don't know, simple one. I'll go with the more complicated one first, and then I'll get to the the simpler question, which is about pricing. So the the complicated question is. Is there a mechanism to connect volunteers to productions and vice versa, a bullet board of sorts? Well, uh, that's actually a feature that we are, I should have mentioned that uh, we're going to do in the near future. Uh, we're going to have something equivalent to like a casting call, mm -hmm. where if you're looking for people to help out on a particular production, you can like, just put out based on certification or whatever else. Uh, there is the ability here already – over here um, – to say whether you're willing to volunteer, and that will dovetail into this. So anybody who's willing to, to volunteer would get that in the form of an email and also on their homepage. Mm -hmm. There'll be a link in here looking for, especially if you're if you fit the profile, it'll it'll appear up here. So that's that's another feature that's coming soon. So like if you if you if you need someone to do, you know, I need someone certified in studio production or advanced studio or you know advanced Photoshop, to, you know, to do graphics, you know. Mm -hmm. Do that. Who's willing to volunteer? Boom. If you fit the, that description, then it will get sent out to you, and then you can, you know, either say, "Hey, I'm, I'm, yeah, I'd love to," or "No, we're not interested." <laughs> yeah, I think that's a really great question and a great thing for you guys to work on because, um, as a member-centric uh, peg tool, 
uh, you know, you have an opportunity to help folks connect their members to each other, whereas I think, uh, I don't think anyone's ever been able to really actively use Facile or other systems for that purpose. We've always had to kind of create our own tools to let our producers connect with each other. Yeah. Once um, we're done with reports, we're going to put in some really cool stuff, so just have to wrap that up. Okay. You know, Chris had another question on pricing. I'm going to skip it for now, uh, just because there's one more question from William, and then we'll come back to Chris's pricing question. Um, William's question is, when a member signs up for a class and receives a notification to bring a check to the first class, is that dialogue able to be altered to 24 hours before the class, 488 hours before, et cetera? So um, I, I guess what I'm taking away there is they just want to know, you know, how much can they change uh, member notifications to fit their own particular rules, you know, if they require people to pay two days in advance or something like that. Um, that's not changeable right now, but that, that wouldn't take much to do that if that's really important to them. I could, could make that happen. And just curious, are most of your folks who are, are using this right now with, um, with payments either for classes or membership, are they having everyone pay online? Do they... Have you seen that mostly people are bringing in checks? I mean, obviously you need to be flexible in this world because you can't count on everyone having right. one payment type. But uh, I don't think anybody is using the payment engine as of yet. Okay. I think they're still doing that. It's a it's a slow rollout for some of these places. So yeah, uh, you know, especially with something this new and you mm -hmm. know, no one's done the whole you know member interaction thing. You know, so people are kind of going cautious with it. But the functionality is all there and it works. Great. Um, for everybody whose questions I've answered, if I haven't answered it correctly or if I didn't, uh, oh, here, actually, so Ed just wrote in on that same subject. He says, we want payment before the workshop. We get lots of no-shows. So, uh, yeah, it, it definitely sounds like um, different folks are going to have different rules for how they how they want their payment and when they need it by to confirm. Um, but, uh, okay. I'm sure, I'm sure that uh, anybody who's interested in, in deploying this can speak with you and you can set up those parameters. Uh, yeah, that's, that's not a hard thing to do at all. Yeah. Okay. Um, so back to the only one word question I have in here. Uh, oh, and then there's more to come in. Great. Um, but the one word question is from Chris saying pricing. And I know that's crucial for folks because, um, you know, historically folks have been kind of stuck on a, a system that they bought once many years ago as an ongoing price thing. People want to know what's it really cost, where they're taking out a budget. So. Uh, if you guys could speak on your pricing for a minute, and then afterwards we'll go through the rest of the questions. All right, so um, let me just bring it up here so I don't misspeak. <laughs> okay. All right, hold on. There we go. Okay, so um, for the basic tier, um, it includes up to 100 active users. Um, Phone and email support if you want uh, in, uh, equipment and member information import, it's $250, and um, that is $690 a year, or if you want to pay monthly, it's $60 a month. Um, the middle tier is that's up to 200 active users, and that includes um, all the payment email options, all the reporting options. Uh, importing is $150, it's a one time fee, and that's $1,000 a year or $90 a month. And then the advanced tier, that's 400 plus active users. Um, that's free import of equipment and member information. Um, that's advanced payment and email options, like the casting call that we were just talking about. Um, uh, so that's $1,320 a year or $120 a month. So did you say the lowest tier is essentially 60 a month and the highest tier is 120? Yeah, it's right, 60 a month or 690 a year. Uh, that gives you up to 100 active users as defined in root share. Okay. So, um, I mean, to be honest, I mean, you're, you're better off going with the middle advanced tier because those, those are going to give you your reporting options, whereas the basic tier is, is basically just to track stuff for reservations. Mm -hmm. That sort of thing, and some people may just need that, and they don't need that reporting. And there, there is a center or two out there that I know does not, you know, does doesn't need those reporting features. But I think most people want that reporting, need it. So. Yeah, yeah. I would say feedback I've gotten from people is that um, reporting is the main reason people have been stuck on Facile for so long. Even if they hate aspects of the of the workflow, they need those reports to turn into the the city or to the cable company. So. Um, so in essence, ninety dollars a month, um, or you said it was a thousand. 
for the year, year for the would be the, the, the medium tier that most folks would probably want where it would cover reports. Right. Um, great. Um, two more questions here. Actually, a couple more. But um, Jen from Northampton says, uh, last time she spoke with you, Dan, you mentioned PayPal integration. Um, is that something that's still uh, still being implemented then? PayPal integration? That's that's uh, That has been done. Oh, okay. So I think... Uh, Eric went over that. Um, yeah, that's where you yeah, set it up right here. Just go for it a sec. So, so you, you integrate PayPal, and then the members can use PayPal to pay their their annual membership dues or their individual class dues. Correct. Yes. And it's through the it's through the PayPal's API. It's not you don't put in your username and password. I got to mm -hmm. make that very clear. It's through PayPal's API, and all, all that is specified in the user manual. So please don't put in if you go with Rushier, don't put in your username and password there. And if you need help. That's a big thing that we're very big on is is um, email and phone support. So um, we're, we're very big on that. Um, we try to get back to you, um, you know, within the day, mm -hmm. <laughs> if not within the hour. <laughs> yeah. That's the case. Well, so, well, one of the great things about you guys being um, so small is that you are extremely responsive. I know every time I've had a question for you, you've gotten back very quickly. Um, Jen just wanted to say thank. She just wanted to make sure that was not still in development. Um, all of us have uh, had interactions with software products, even ones I've sold myself, uh, where something is not quite there yet, and nobody wants to, to to count on a feature that's not finished. So PayPal's finished. It's just a question of folks using the right type of account. Um, all right, so a couple more questions that have come in, um, two from Brian and uh, one from Nick and one from Ed. I'll tackle Nick's question first, then Ed's, and then Brian's. Uh, Nick asks, how many admin users? So I'm guessing he's asking how many maximum users uh, you can have as admin. There's no limit on the number of admin users. Okay. Um, and then uh, Ed's question is also about user. He says, the term user, does that limit the number of people I can enter into the system or only the number of individuals that can access the system on their own? It's, it's active users. So whoever you designate as an active user in Russia, you can make them inactive or active. Okay. Yeah. So it depends on the tier. So tier one is 100, up to 100, tier two is up to 200, and then tier three is 400 plus. Got it. Um, so really it comes down to how many producers, whether um, they're going to be interacting with the system direct themselves or you're just putting them in, but how many active producers are you going to be having tracked through the system? Right. Right. Okay. Um, uh, let's see. Ed says, perfect, thanks. Um, I know I would say I, I was going to get to Brian's questions, but there's one more from Matt. Sorry, Brian, I'll hold off on your two until we get through this. Um, I'm wondering if I missed this part of the webinar, Matt says, but can you briefly go over what payment types are available? For example, we keep track of all payments right now in Facile. They handle rem membership fees, which I know Rushare does, but mm -hmm. Facile also handles dubbing fees, class payments, and equipment costs. So I, I, I think he wants to know, you know a little bit more about both the payment types and also um, what else you might be able to log. They, they say they log what each piece of equipment costs in Facile. So you, you can definitely, uh, we have members, a membership class signups. We are at uh, beefing up the, the payment at a few months. In terms of equipment costs, I, I'm not sure what he means. I think he just means the, the basically what, recording that in the asset area. We do. You do that in the asset. So if somebody has a $3,000 Sony camera, they want to mark in their um, the initial cost, either just for their own tracking or because later they want to have um, in their reports, you know, an indication of how many hours. I know the station I last worked at always uh, generated somewhat BS reports saying they provided $16 million worth of service to the community, learning to seal and, uh, and adding things up that way. Right, so, that's, um, that, that's that daily rental value there. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And the current, that's, you know, you can put in whatever you want. The current value is, you know, and depreciation. That's all accounting stuff there. And, of course, right. the price is what you paid for it. Um, and in addition to that, there's maintenance records which, which you can add and uh, modify, delete. Oh, can this you, looks perfect, then. Can you scroll down a little bit, Eric, just to show them that real quick? There you go. So. Ah, so you can track the maintenance on any individual camera and figure yeah. out how much you spent to have it fixed. Correct. Yep. That's great. I, I think that's... Um, one of those things that people have needed before they can leave another system that they're using for that, and I haven't seen a lot of other systems track that. Um, okay, uh, there's a couple more questions coming in, but I keep putting off Brian's too, so let me jump back up to that. 
his first question is, are we able to set facility hours and holiday hours and have the reservation system respect that? Is that, uh, is that something you can talk about for a minute? Uh, that has <coughs> has been requested, but right now uh, I don't have the ability to do that right now. Uh, the calendar control I'm using uh, doesn't really make that all that easy, so I'll have to figure out a way to do that. Okay. So at the moment, if somebody tried to reserve the studio for Christmas Day, there's not a way to block out the whole day except maybe reserving all equipment or something. Well, the one thing you could do is um, import your calendar. I think I showed that earlier. And you could here in settings you can import your calendar so you can import your calendar and simply say no res you know site access center closed or whatever to give people an indication that they can't reserve on that day okay so through, through Google you would do that um, so you could have a Google calendar where you put all the days that you guys are closed maybe the half days or something and then that could show up in here even though it's not technically um, blocking the reservation from the day of the alert. Yes, yeah, they still would be able to do it, but at least there would be some kind of indication. Mm -hmm. Okay. It's, a, it's something we're, it is something we're looking into, um, but, you know, we want to get through these other things first. Oh, sure. Um, Brian, if that didn't answer that question fully, just let me know. Um, the next question from Brian was, sorry if this was already mentioned, but can you send a mass email to all members or member types? So ability to, to group message everybody or all members who are certified or all members who are volunteers or however you might um, specify. What, what do you have for that? Uh, when it comes to email, right now we have receipt emails, meaning if you uh, sign up for a class or renew your membership, we have automated emails that go out for uh, member renewal, late mm -hmm. equipment, stuff like that. Then we have the other ones, the, the more push-based ones, like uh, somebody has requested uh, a, a reservation, uh, a piece of equipment. Then after that is going to be version three of email where you're going to be able to specify whatever you want. You'll be able to generate a, a list of users based on, you know, classes they've taken or whatever else and send that out. But no, but that's, mm -hmm. that's in the works, but not done yet. Okay. Um, Matt's last question that I see here is actually a follow-up on the, when we were talking about types of payment, uh, being able to track membership fees, uh, class payments, equipment costs. The one part we, we didn't address from his question he wanted us to go back to is about dubs of programs. Um, I know the last station I worked at about 10 years ago, uh, we would charge $10 per DVD. Uh, it wasn't obviously a large amount of money in the end. It might have been $1,000 uh, in the end of the year, but it was something that we needed to track uh, both in our, you know, financially and, and just for report purposes. Do you guys have any way to track that type of payment or any suggestions of how one might be able to do that? Uh, we currently do not do that, but we've had, again, that request to do that. Um, there's been a few sites that do do sell DVDs and the like, so that's, mm -hmm. that's another one on the, on the list, the to-do list. Actually, actually, not all that hard. Um, we'll just put up a, a page where you can, you know, a, a page to, to order something. Yeah, and, uh, record it from there. So yeah, that's that's also on the list of things to do. So so not a that'll never happen, but something that if a, a customer has that particular need, you can um, factor that into their uh, yeah into their system. Yeah, when, yeah well, like I said, we've taken a lot of suggestions, and the suggestions we almost always will do are ones that really increase or enhance functionality. We've had some requests where it's just something completely out of the norm that's very specific to one site. But mm -hmm. things that are you know generic to to multiple sites are things we, we will almost definitely get to. We've probably taken at least ninety five percent of our suggestions, and the other five percent we haven't gotten to yet. Yeah. Well, it's tough. I mean, the, the crazy thing about um, the Peg Station workflow is that we're all similarly unique. Uh, <laughs> yeah. We all do things different than all the all the commercial operations, and we don't always do things similar to each other. Um, I I know you guys are running into that as anybody does trying to build a custom workflow. Um, best you can do is try to you know solve the core things that apply for everyone. I should actually uh, speak to how we update the site. You'll see down here this little you know 1.0.95. The 95 indicates the number of times I've updated the site. Um, wow. Updates happen in the middle of the night. You're none the wiser. You never have to worry about you know CDs or updating anything. It's all in the cloud. It's all seamless. So these things will they'll pop in. You'll get an email from me indicating what do a little functionality, and I've sent out a lot of them. Just ask anybody who's using our system, and you know things roll out pretty quick and pretty easily. 
That's why I'm looking forward to get past reports because then I can start pounding out a lot of these little smaller things. Generally, smaller features take a week or two. Now, um, you know, this is just transitioning from, since I have no more questions here, uh, I just want to transition back to Tightrope for a second. Um, we uh, we kind of started in that same way ourselves where it was, you know, each individual specific need we would try to address. And now, obviously, we're, we're quite a ways down. Um, and uh, we, we now roll the new features people request into new versions. And just yesterday, we made an announcement on our blog that we're looking for beta testers for all of our product lines um, in a more formal way than in the past where we might have just identified an individual customer we do. So this is just a, a, a message out to everyone who's listening who happens to be a, a tightrope customer. If you are the type who likes to play with a beta, likes to get into it before anybody else, give us active feedback. Be patient when something new isn't working quite the right way and you know, uh, flexible enough to work around it if that new thing actually changes things and makes it not the way you wanted. Um, we are looking for folks to contact us and say, hey, uh, I'm that ballsy guy or girl who wants to beta test. And we're going to actually be formalizing, you know, um, working with uh, beta testers in a more regular way. Um, so um, that's, that's the tightrope announcement here. Um, I, I think we've answered all the questions that have come in. If anybody has any last questions, just send them in right now. Um, last thing I just want to say is uh, just about working with Dan and Eric at Bushare. Um, the, the building, I'm really impressed with them because they're building this product out of peg needs. They're building it on a budget level that I think works for the majority of peg stations who don't have a large budget. Uh, it is a, a big transition for folks often to think from moving from something that they buy one time to something that's an ongoing cost of software as a service. But it, it really does, I think, um, make more sense that this kind of thing be a software as a service so that you're getting, um, you know, regular uh, support for it, regular feature upgrades, and, uh, you know, ability for the thing to really keep current and not be a product you bought once 10 years ago and struggle through 10 years later. Um, so, you know, I just, I thank you guys for, for being, um, being peg-centric, that seems weird to say. Uh, not a lot of folks are, you know, coming out of this industry and, and putting all the effort it takes to develop something for the other folks in the industry. So. Well, thanks for having us. We certainly yeah. appreciate this opportunity. Yeah, thanks a so bunch. Um, and again, uh, you know, on top of the fact that we have uh, the beta program we're announcing, anybody who has feedback for me um, about this, you know, Rusher webinar or about what features they think we should be on our end uh, talking about tying in, or, or where if, if anybody else has a, an interest in our API, uh, the, the one that hasn't been publicized yet that, that Rushare is going to be building on. Uh, we want to be really flexible and, and work with everybody and, and all projects. So um, please just be in touch with me directly over email or phone or however you can track us down. So, um, I think we're at the end of our, our window. I'm sure people who have been sitting here for an hour are ready to go, uh, go back to their normal day job. So um, unless there's any other questions or anything else uh, Dan or Eric want to say, I just want to say thanks to everybody for, for joining the webinar. No, thank you. No, thanks thank to you. everyone out there who, who participated. Right. Yeah, thanks for, uh, for joining in. All right, well, thank you all. If anybody has any questions, just reach out to me afterwards. Have a great day.